I've seen and experienced a lot over the last seven decades in my career. I've met many interesting people, performed over 25,000 shows, and yes, even tuned in on the thoughts in the minds of over one million. But then, who's counting? Now, I'm telling you what really happened. Welcome to Kreskin's Amazing Experiences. This is Kreskin, and of course you know me as the Amazing Kreskin, and I'm going to share with you an incident, or actually a mass incident, that's become an integral part of my life and associated with me all over the world. It deals with hypnotism, and of course, if you think about it, hypnosis has become a fascinating story for motion pictures, for movies for crime cases, and you name it, and for excuses on why people behave the way they do. Now, if it sounds like there's a touch of sarcasm in this, understand that early in my career, from my early teens on, I was known not only as a mentalist, but also a hypnotist. And my work and hypnosis was associated all over the world. I'm not discrediting my association with hypnosis, but I am modifying it simply because I became suspicious of hypnotism. After all, when I was 12, 13, 14, 16, I was often seeing 20 and 30 people a week who were being referred to me because of pain problems, because of disorganized feelings, because of stress and what have you, and it was felt that hypnotism and my use of the technique could become a strengthening point for them. Then something happened. As I performed on the stage and performed in private work because of having an office, then became an associate with a clinical psychologist by the time I was 18 or 19 years old, Dr. Harold Hansen, I became more and more alert to the tremendous power of hypnosis. Finally, I came to the conclusion that hypnosis does not exist. It's a piece of crap, and we have misinterpreted all through the years what we thought was a special trance-like state. As a matter of fact, I was sued by hypnotists in the early 80s, 1980s, because of my claim that there really was no hypnotic trance, that it was purely the power of suggestion. She took me to court, and it became a courtroom case that was covered all over the Western world. True, I could take a person and within 10 minutes erase pain that they were experiencing. I could tr bring them into an operating room and see an operation take place with no chemicals of any kind in that they were experiencing no pain at all. But what made it fascinating to me was that I was able to work under conditions that you don't usually associate with hypnosis. A quiet room, a quiet office, you name it. It was times when I could walk up to people and simply gesture hypnotically and they'd start to respond to what I was suggesting. It sounded like a gimmick. It sounded like a fake act. It sounded like show business except that it was really happening in the manner in which I was producing it. In one particular case, I was accosted by a gentleman who intended to murder me. But that didn't work out that well, because 10 minutes later, as a psychologist standing 10 
feet away, looked with awe. He saw that this person who was about to take me in was now sitting on the floor with me, playing with a pet dog that he had many, many years earlier. I created the hallucination of that animal. So I began to become suspicious of the hypnotic trance because a mere casual remark sometimes could remove pain. It was nothing for me to take a hundred people outdoors, outside a building, and end up having them lying on the earth, almost paralyzed by mere suggestions that took only seven, eight minutes or so to exercise. Then I begin to see what was the common factor in all of this. There were no drugs. I wasn't injecting anybody with anything. I wasn't suddenly accosting them and shaking them. The only common thing were two factors. One, my remarks. The other, when I didn't talk, and there were times I never spoke, I simply gestured hypnotically, and the person ended up on the floor or on the ground or incapacitated amongst 15 other people on the stage who could no longer speak or exercise their words. I realized that the key factor behind this was the power of suggestion one of the most tremendous forces known to mankind. There are people who've moved entire sets of hundreds of others by just the remarks they made. There are people who've created panic and hysteria by remarks that they made. And I began to realize that this power of suggestion, perhaps I had it as a gift, that I sophisticated it in an unusual way, but it was the key behind so much of what was happening. Well, I was sued. I was sued by a psychologist when I made a claim that there's really no proof of a hypnotic trance. If there were proof of a hypnotic trance, then why can the same thing be done with the person wide awake, totally conscious, by pure suggestion? and I was sued by this hypnotist. Now, there's a behind-the-scenes story. It's the kind of intrigue that you read about, or if you see a whodunit mystery story play reenacted, and you hear more details of what is going on. Because a person, it turns out, that I found out was going to this hypnotist. I found out the schedule that this person had. And don't you know, she had an appointment at this medical center to see the psychiatrist, the hypnotist, and was going to be conditioned and helped. However, there was another factor involved. Because during the trial, when the hypnotist was there with the subject, I defied the hypnotist to hypnotize the subject and have him remember everything that happened that day. They were surprised. The judge didn't expect this. What does that have to do with the case? I said, no, let's pick a time date. I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was 10 minutes after 8. Maybe it was quarter of... of, of uh, of seven in the morning, what have you. The hypnotist proceeded to hypnotize his subject. And then when he had his subject under hypnosis, I said, where are they standing? Doesn't the subject have an appointment? Yes, but he has to wait outside because the, the psychologist is seeing another patient. They waited outside. And then it came time for the subject to go into the office and see the hypnotist, the psychiatrist. And then when it was all over, they left. 
and said goodbye. And that was the end of the scene. Oh, no, it wasn't. It was the scenario that I rigged to embarrass, to literally embarrass the person who was the hypnotic subject. You see, a young man who was coming to some of my sessions and being programmed to respond hypnotically, I made an agreement with him that he would go to the clinic and wait in the lobby. And as soon as he saw the patient, whom we showed a picture of, come into the lobby, he would stand with that person. Not converse that much, but just stand and talk. And don't you know, he did exactly that. He came in, he talked to the person, he acted very, very friendly, very, very friendly, and then when all was said and done, he said goodbye because he went in to the office to be treated by the hypnotist. He was told by my request and the psychiatrist who was rehypnotizing him through all this to give us as great details as possible as he could about the scene. When the case was over, the judge in my trial was so disgusted. He said, we're throwing this out. This is a disgrace. You see, when this person was waiting to be called into the office, another person was with him. My man, who had come to sessions with me, he was attending there. But he wasn't simply attending there. He was dressed in one of the most outrageous outfits that you wouldn't even expect a human being to, to dress like this. Crazy looking outfit, crazy, stupid looking outfits. It, it, was a, it was laughable. And he was talking and talking and motioning and motioning. And then the scene ended with the patient going inside. The most dramatic thing of all, however, is that as dramatic as this memory was, as unusual as this scene is that you could never forget, he, now being hypnotized again and taken back to that case, never remembered seeing this young man there, never remembered the outrageous outfit which appeared in some magazines that was so stupid looking, never remembered any of the conversation that took place. And the question is, how could he not recall something as dramatic like this, especially if he was under deep hypnosis? The conclusion of the case was, he's no more hypnotized than a duck walking down the street. That this is a powerful memory. And even with the power of hypnosis, it didn't work because hypnosis was not taking place and was not helping him remember more vividly than ever before. He forgot the most important details, and I proved that in the case in which the psychiatrist and the judges decided in my favor. I had won the case and proved that hypnosis had nothing to do with it. The bottom line is, this has changed my relationship with the whole hypnosis scene. Do you know today, and years since that took place, no hypnotist wanted to challenge me because they knew that I had up my sleeve a tactic that would make the whole scene almost ludicrous. And incidentally, if someone decides to challenge me again, if you saw what I did at that time was wild, wait till you see how the next time will show that nobody is in a hypnotic trance at all. They're simply responding to the power of suggestion. So for that next incident, whenever it will be, let's just say, to be continued.